Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today we are looking at Zoroark Greninja, the archetype that has once been a meme of its own right when you were playing the uh, Break Evolution. But now from Forbidden Light we get a new coat of paint that we can try with Greninja and we're thinking that Zoroark could be the way to make this a successful list. So let's kick off with the basic concepts, then we'll get into the list and uh, matchups and all that good stuff. So, first of all, drawing cards is good. You're a Zoroark deck, so how bad could this deck really be? That's what you have to really start off with, saying, Zoroark is so insane, there's been so many partners for him that have all been reasonable. Speaking of some of those reasonable partners, we've seen moderate success with Zoroark Salazzle and Zoroark Decidueye. Obviously, those decks aren't really hype. They did die down after seeing sparks of play here and there. But the intention of this Greninja list is similar to those in that you're using this additional damage that you gain from the Frogadier and the Greninja GX to either target the bench to set up KOs or just to reach one-shots into the active by spamming a bunch of extra damage counters all into the opponent's active Pokemon. So um, definitely flexible damage, trying to um, scale your output really nicely with Zoroark. You even have the option to take mid-game prize with this list, which you didn't have with the Salazzle build, so... Why we're thinking that the Greninja list could be better than the previous sort of versions of this deck is that it's faster than Decidueye because the Frogadiers actually do something. Whereas if you played a list and you had to evolve into your Dartrix and, you know, we're not playing Candy in this list. So it's more realistic to get into Frogadiers. And as soon as you get into Frogadiers, they're doing something. They're impacting the board. Getting 20 damage on a Tapu Lele is incredible already. Uh, it's like a pre-planted Kakui for you so that you can one-shot them later with a Choice Band or with a future Greninja drop. So just getting the Frogadiers, they're already good on board, uh, which is not the case for Decidueye. And uh, it's more flexible than Salazzle. So again, putting that Frogadier on board is always going to be good for you because that 20 doesn't have to be on the active. If it's going to be wasted damage, it can go onto the bench. And that's something that you couldn't do with Salazzle. It only helps you reach one-shots. Whereas this lets you... Um, do whatever you want to. You can target down as a ruler if you have, you know, a couple of Greninja GX or something, so you can deny the opponent doing, like, Acerola loops against you and stuff. Um, or you can just use those Frogadiers, bank them on Lele's so you can deal with those later on in the game. So, really, really good in comparison to the predecessors of this archetype. And on top of that, we also gain Shadow Stitching. Shadow Stitching is a bonkers attack. That's one of the main reasons why people have, you know grit their teeth and continue to play Greninja, no matter how inconsistent it is, at the end of the day, Shadow Stitching is insane. It's still really good against um, opposing Zoroark decks. It's also very good um, against the new Malamar stuff and a bunch of other ability type decks as well. So really, really just Shadow Stitching's OP OP. So trying to squeeze in Shadow Stitching at any opportunity is going to be good for you. So gaining this whilst having, you know, backup damage for you is going to be nice. So you can slow the, slow the game down when you need to with Shadow Stitching. Either you're, once again, setting up a knockout with a Zoroark, or you're um, building up more Greninja pieces in the background and getting snipes elsewhere. So being able to turn the game into your tempo is going to be nice, because at the end of the day, Shadow Stitching plus N is still one of the most dirty combos in the game. And uh, we have that available to us in, that in this list. So... Let's jump on with the Pokemon 23 total. Plenty of Pokemon here. The slide is really full of stuff because uh, there's a lot of text on these new cards. First of all, we're going to play 4-4 Zoroark, 2 Lele, and Mew. These are all fairly self-explanatory cards. We want to max out the Zoroark, get as much trading as possible. He's also the main attacker with Righteous Beating, so um, 20 times the number of your Pokemon in play. Uh, a base of 120 if your bench is full. Choice band gets you to 150. So as I said, the Frogadier damage and the Greninja damage can help us reach 170 or 180 respectively. Or playing multiple of them can get, uh, you know, a multitude of numbers that can help you out. So uh, we're looking to really cash in on this single energy attachment of Zoroark as much as possible. The Mew EX is in here to help out against things like Lucario and Buzzwall, as well as um, maybe a handful of other things out there right now, like the um, old Necrozma GX may see more play. And that's weak to Psychic as well. So something to uh, bear in mind. The Mew is going to be really nice. And it means, similar to um, why the Guardi Glade used to play Mew EX instead of just Mewtwo. It's because you need to be much more proactive. What the intention is, the Mew EX is going to deal with the opening Buzzwall. And we're hoping, even if this gets knocked out, we do play Stretcher to recycle it. But 
The theory is that we may not need to recycle it because hopefully towards the mid game we would have got some more shurikens um, splashed onto their most dangerous Pokemon like the Lycanrocs or the Buzzwells, whatever they try and move into after their initial Buzzwell. Hopefully we can set up the damage with our frogs so that the Zoroark can actually respond on them. Or the Greninja can respond on them as well because it can attack us uh, also. So um, really good stuff. The Muse can help us out in the early game. A couple of Lele's. Uh, don't want to play more than two just because bench space is going to be premium for these frog boys. The more the merrier really, just like with the Decidueye build. And as you can see, very thick line of this Greninja. Four Froki. One of them is going to be the Bubble Froki just for the option. Uh, but overall, 70 HP, I think, is going to be more safe and secure. So going for three of the new Froki. Uh, their attacks are just vanilla, so it's just one for 10 and a water colorless for 20. That's, you know, fine, I guess. But the fact is, you have 10 more hit points, which is good for you. It means you can survive an attack, a horn attack from a Bulu. You can survive an energy drive as well. So uh, that's going to be really nice for you in the early turns. And... Um, here are the new cards that we gained. Four Frogadiers that you can see down there. 80 hit points. They still have a one retreat cost, so not quite as good as Crobat. But Gale Shuriken is the same ability as Golbat, which uh, allows you to put two counters on one of your opponent's Pokemon when you evolve. Really cool. Uh, we're going to try and get this as often as possible. As I said, the synergy on Tapu Lele's especially is going to be amazing for writers beating with a choice band. Um, additionally, just setting up, you know, anything, anything that's on the opponent's board. It's a math fixer at the end of the day, and that's what we're going to try and use here. And uh, moving onwards from that, there's the three new Greninja GX cards. 230 hit points, very tanky if you're up against things that aren't grass Pokemon, because this is weak to grass. Um, and it has the Shuriken Flurry um, ability. When you place Pokemon from hand to evolve one of your Pokemon during your turn, you may put three counters on one of your opponent's Pokemon. So again... Um, just like the Crobat of old, we're going to use this guy to, again, improve our maths. Can reach 180 very easily. Can start targeting lower HP basics, all that good stuff. Set up things for future. The more the merrier once again. So overall, it's not infinite damage output like a Decidueye build. Uh, you have to be much more selective with your snipes, but uh, the math fixing element of the deck is very, very strong in my opinion. The Greninja GX also has a couple of attacks. As I said, 230 HP is very tanky and it offers a different weakness uh, from the Zoroark, which is also helpful. Haze Slash does 110 for a water DCE and you may shuffle this Pokemon and all cards attached to it into your deck. Um, you can choose this option, of course. Um, normally, you wouldn't do it the first time you use Haze Slash. Uh, you can wait till you get hit back and then the second time you can Haze Slash and move yourself back into your deck. You are... Filling your deck up with some uh, kind of chunky, clunky cards. But hopefully you have other Frogadiers and stuff set up on the board. So maybe you could even get uh, Shuriken Flurries for the following turn and stuff like that. But in general, it's an additional 2 hit KO style attack um, that can improve the tank ability of this deck. Similar to when we see the Stage 1's alright decks using Acerola. This is like an inbuilt Acerola for you, but it's a little bit less immediate. So um, it is a little bit expensive on the old energy cost, 2 attachments. Um, but I think you can get away with it in this list. And uh, as I said, you don't always have to jump uh, back into the deck immediately. It's your choice. So that's pretty cool. And the GX attack is Shadowy Hunter GX. For again, that water colorless colorless cost, you get to do 130 to one of your opponent's bench Pokemon. So as I mentioned earlier, the Frogadier setting up the Lele can be nice for Guzma plays. But it can all also be great for rounding out the game with a Shadowy Hunter GX. So... How often have you seen Guzma be the out to game? Well, now it could just be something like finding the Greninja GX or finding a DCE or a Water Energy. These could also be additional outs to game on top of Guzma if you plant one energy on your Frogadier or Greninja early or at any point in the game, really. Uh, the Shadowy Hunter, I think, is a really underrated GX attack. I think we've seen, um, seen it on a few other cards that have been unimpressive but the fact of the matter is this deck has flexible damage so the synergy is within itself it's all wrapped into one nice neat package you can make this gx attack very good if you need it to so um i think this deck is going to be very proficient at dealing with leles so the more leles the opponent plays or other 180 170 hp even like 190 hp uh, gx pokemon the more of those the better matchup this deck has because that gx attack is great and the snipes from previous Frogadiers and Greninjas is just going to make it really filthy, I think. So this GX attack is not one to sleep on. It's the one that you'll use every game. So 
or you'll try to... You, this is the only GX attack you have the option to use, but uh, it's a strong one, and I think it can be a game-winning GX attack as well in, in many cases. And you can see just sneaking in the background, didn't have much space for this guy, but we are going to play one of the classic Greninja from Breakpoint. Uh, as I mentioned, Shadow Stitching is insane, and even just having um, his other attack, I can't even remember what it's called, Moonlight Slash, um, that is, again, sets up damage for Righteous Beating, uh, if you really need it to, and it can be your non-GX attacker, so that's pretty cool for you. So uh, if we do run into things like Zygarde GX or the Hooper, we have the snipe damage that we can do from Frogadiers and Greninjas, and uh, we can also just attack with this Greninja as well. So all pretty good stuff. Really, really thick line of the Greninja, similar to the Decidueye builds, and the case is you want to have like probably three Zoroks on board, and then fill your board from there with as many frogs as possible. Start building them up, getting extra damage. And uh, yeah, board space is going to be a little bit tight, but I think uh, it can pay off for you. From there, the items are fairly streamlined. And don't click away just because you've seen two timables. I think it's actually correct in this list. We are going to play one rescue stretcher first of all, though. Um, again, just more access to getting those frog boys going. Can recycle the Mew can recycle your Zoroark pieces as well. I've always been a fan of Stretcher. I think it's like an immediate um, response card in many situations against things like Palo City or just early Buzzwalls and stuff like that. I think it's just a really good card for you in general as a Zoroark player. I've played it in a lot of my Zoro builds and I'll continue to do so really. Um, two timables, yes. Uh, Zoroark known for playing uh, Evo Soda in one or two counts at times, depending on you know the meta and how much tech space you actually have or you need to commit to. And um, uh, instead of Evo Soda, you want to play Timer Balls in here. It just makes sense because Evo Soda doesn't work uh, with your fro your Frogadiers and Greninjas. And it can still do the same thing as an Evo Soda when you're trying to grab your Zoroarks, on average at least. So um, it's not like the high roller card. I'm not just playing it instead of Evo Soda. There's a reason for it. And it's why some Zoro Lycanroc players tech in Timer Ball as like a one-off for quote-unquote extra consistency. Uh, we're going to try and do the same here because at the end of the day, you want to find your frogs and build them as quickly as possible for extra damage output. They're going to be incredible for you. So two timables are going into this list. So going to be some fun to test this out at the very least. Four copies of Puzzle. It's a Zoroark deck after all. And uh, four copies of Ultra Ball. Three copies of Field Blower, choosing not to play any of our own stadium. So to counterbalance that, we're going to increase the Field Blower count to the healthy three so we can get around parallel as often as possible because that is going to be a big hindrance for the progress of this deck. Um, it's also going to be really important against Garbodor, of course, because we are fully ability reliant, really. Uh, so high, high blow account is going to be important. Two choice bands. I would really like to fit in a third, to be honest, because we are trying to be as aggressive as possible. And ultimately, the Frogadier gets in there to be useful more often than the, than the Greninja does. I mean, the Greninja still eventually comes, but sometimes people just like try and deal with the Frogadiers and stuff like that, but they've already done a cheeky 20 and alongside Choice Band, 20 is oftentimes enough. So um, that's really good for you. So I kind of want to work in a third Choice Band, but I think uh, space is an issue. I'd rather have a timer ball. <laughs> and uh, finally one float stone. It's a little on the cheeky count. Um, the Frokies and Frogadiers both have one retreat, and the Greninja GX actually has a two retreat cost, so it's definitely on the low side. Could see this being increased if we find issues with it, but I think this alongside Guzmas, because the deck naturally wants to be Guzmaring anyway, I think a lot of the time, you can get away with it. And even if Guzma's painful for you, you can choose to use the Greninja GX attack on that turn anyway, so I think it's all pretty reasonable overall. From there, we're going to play one copy of Acerola, and this is a way to recycle our Greninjas as well as heal our Zoroarks. Acerola is pretty standard in most Zoro builds overall, and uh, choosing to play it again here. One copy of Mallow to get the specific cards that we need. Um, just a really nice combo with Zoroark when we are trying to reach for these one-shots or get a big burst of damage in a single turn. Three copies of Bridget to try and spam our basic Pokemon and be as consistent as possible. Three Guzmas to access the bench when need be. I think that's plenty alongside the GX attack of Greninja. Three copies of N and three Cynthia to round out the deck. I think it's all very standard staple lines of Zoroark players' lists, ultimately. And uh, finally, we round it out with six energy cards. Uh, a little on the low side, just two waters. Um, obviously, DC, we know why that's in here. 
Uh, but DC also works for shadow stitching as well because it's a colorless cost. So the waters themselves aren't integral to the list. And I think ultimately you'll only really attach one to one Greninja GX during the entire game. So I think two is all you really need realistically. One can help you retreat um, Froakies and Frogadiers as well. So that's also like an option for you. Um, so sometimes planting one water energy on the first turn can really help you retreat into your Zoroarks for turn two. So bear that in mind. Potentially playing an extra energy just for that alone, maybe over a float stone, I could see being the case as well. But at the moment, going for the cheeky line of six so that we can max out the uh, the Greninja line itself. I think uh, space is a little bit tight for this list. So here is the list in full. Pause now if you really want to. And that gives you a good overview of what we're looking at. Plenty of Pokemon. That really does take up the bulk of the list. Uh, because we want to try and spam these Frogadiers and Greninjas as often as possible. And the rest is just trying to make it work as much as possible, really. Looking at text, we can go more towards a Devolve route if we really need to. Tapu Koko flying, flipping things. Setting them up for Greninjas and um, Frogadiers later on down the line can be nice for you. The reason why I'm not playing this, even though it's a really good start for you in the deck... Is that it's a bench space at the end of the day. And I think I value an extra Frogadier potentially becoming a Greninja than I do like a Flying Flip during a turn. Especially because you really only want to Flying Flip if it's turn one. And it's not that likely to be honest. So I'm choosing not to play the Coco. And for that reason I'm also not playing the Espeon. We've sort of seen the Decidueye build try and use Coco Espeon. I think that's still where it's better placed. Because you have frequent damage every single turn with the Decidueyes. And that's just not the case with the Greninja build. Sometimes you're getting very few amounts of uh, spread damages with these shurikens. But overall, I think um, the list is fine not being a Devolve variant. I think you're much better just trying to set up KOs rather than actually, you know, spend your entire game plan flying, flipping and shurikening as much as possible. Because ultimately you need your board to be full of Zoroarks most of the time to actually get anything going in the first place. So I think these cards are a bit of a trap. I think they're a little bit too difficult, a little bit too clunky. And you've already seen that we're playing 23 Pokemon, and that's already loads, so <laughs> I'm not that willing to play many more. From there, there's a couple of stereotypical Zoroark cards. There's the Resource Management Guru, which I always consider to be reasonable. Um, it can help out in Zoro Mirrors. Um, it can help out against Mill as well, so it's a reasonable card just in general. I think Mill may be going away from Forbidden Light, at least in the early stages, just because of the hype of Malamar. Um, so I think you don't really need to tech him right now, but it's something to keep an eye on for future. Your own Parallel City, much worse in this list than other lists, uh, because you reduce your own damage if you're going to be using the Greninja aspect. I know that's the same for Glycopod, but Glycopod's numbers are much better inherently anyway. Um, so that's a little bit more awkward for you. If anything, you could play this as an extra defense against opposing parallels, just because yours is in play, the opponent can't do it to you, so... That's the consideration, but at the moment, I've said so many times that space is really pre uh, premium for this deck. There's already a few cards that I'd rather put in before a parallel, like a Floatstone or a Water Energy, or a few other cards here and there. The other fun card you might want to try out is Super Scoop Up in some capacity. Maybe even above those timer balls, you could play a couple of Scoop Ups. Scoop Up can give you extra trades if you need to. It can give you extra Leles, but... Overall, it's going to give you extra healing as well as more snipes. And at the end of the day, those are all pluses for you. The only awkward thing is you're flipping a coin to get any activation. And if it's tails, it's really awkward for you. So right now, I'm liking just the 1A Cerola. But if you can find space for like three scoop ups, I think it's reasonable to test it out. Uh, maybe you can even cut puzzle from this list and just go for a scoop up build like an old school bat list. I'm not too sold on it personally, but I think it's something that you can try out for additional spread and snipes all over the board as well. So let's look at some matchups. I think the Garbodor things, especially Buzzguard, because of the early aggression they could put on you, is going to be awkward. Uh, even with three field blowers, I think it will be an awkward matchup for you because every time Garb sticks to return, you're not getting those um, shurikens on the board, so you're not um, making the math nice for you. And the deck is ultimately very focused on Zoroark attacking. And uh, Zorogarb will have an equal effect against you. Uh, the Bursting Balloons are also going to be awkward math-wise as well. Uh, so potentially that's going to be an issue. Maybe even using uh, Greninja's GX attack to snipe Zoroarks can be a saving grace, but I think that's only like a short-term um, fix, really. And uh, Zoropod will additionally be bad. Not only do they play sometimes two parallel cities 
Um, they are a grass type, so you're pretty much having to only evolve up into Frogadiers. And if you're evolving up into Greninja, it's going to be the non-GX just to Shadow Stitch them, hoping to survive a hit. Then you can maybe Acerola that one Shadow Stitcher and uh, set up Zoroarks on your own end whilst making them draw badly. I think the matchup will be hard. You basically just trade away all your GXs unless they can get you, you know, a means of getting game that turn because they are such a liability against the pod part of the deck. And finally, I think Buzz Ninja. It's a much of a muchness sort of matchup, but they have more weakness against you um, and they will probably be playing Espeon on their end because Buzzwell plus Greninja is much better at taking those early snipes and they'll event they'll pretty much just have more space than the Zora Ninja list will uh, to play Espeon so it makes more sense in that list and Espeon's going to be a huge problem for this one uh, because Zoroark is going to make everything tick and once those go down to Buzzwell spreads plus Greninja pings the deck is going to crumble pretty much so I think those are your outstanding bad matchups I think there may be a few others here and there but overall I think it's fairly reasonable the matchup spread that I've put out right now so my closing thoughts, we've seen this archetype before, just it's had a new coat of paint. We've seen Salazzle, we've seen um, Decidueye, and we've seen Bats. Like, we know what Bats are like, really, overall. So there's so much track record for these sorts of cards that I think we can analyze this fairly reasonably. We know they haven't been top tier previously, but I have more hope for this Greninja list than I did for Decidueye or... Salazzle, uh, because as I said, faster than Decidueye, more flexible than Salazzle, it's better than its predecessors, and you have Shadow Stitching on top of that. So uh, there's a reason to be excited about this archetype when you may compare it to those previous ones, because I believe it is better. And also, my final thought is that if ability le uh, decks are rife, and there's going to be like a bunch of Malamar, maybe this becomes more of a counter deck, and you just play a couple copies of Shadow Stitching instead of just ro uh, just one, and you're trying to Shadow Stitch your way to victory. And that's pretty reasonable, to be honest, because that can win a lot of games. So, uh, yeah, I think that's some food for thought. The list can change up. There's a few things I need to test out with this one, but I think, as always, I like to give a just a reasonable baseline for this deck for you to start testing yourselves and give you a feel of how it is. So let me know what you think about this archetype. Plenty more Forbidden Light decks to come. This was a fun one to talk about, and one that was interesting to try and build and get testing with, because it's a Zoroark deck, so you always have the task of looking at previous Zoro decks and how they function, and how the Decidueye list worked, how Salazzle worked, why they play things like Devo Spray and stuff like that, and why we don't want to. All these sorts of things factor in, so definitely cool to explore this archetype, and I think a lot of people are looking for a home for Greninja, and this is one that a few people just naturally shepherd towards because Zoroark can be partnered with anything. At least that's the motto. So yeah, let me know what you think about this archetype. Is it going to be like hot garbage just like the other um, builds that we've tried to build with Zoroark? But it could just be a little bit better. And I, I personally have hope for it. So let me know what you guys think down below. We'll get the discussion rolling. Le uh, leave a like the video if you did. Subscribe if you haven't already. For now though, it has been Joe from Omnipoke. And I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.